apparently it's that time of day. I was nearly caught out there. I was uh, way off in, well, I was way off in another world, to be honest with you. Good evening, everybody. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. It's night time here. It's 8 p.m. in Ireland. Here in the Boyne Valley, we're on episode number 251, if you can believe it. And uh, tonight we are continuing our exploration of the Brehan Laws in P.W. Joyce's uh, Social History of Ancient Ireland, volume one, published in uh, 1903. And here we are, uh, 13 episodes in. And how much of the book have we actually read that much? I've read that much? Still that much to go. Wow. Anyway, good evening. Hope you're all in good form. Um, we had a storm this morning. It lasted a few hours. It was very windy. Lots of trees down. Um, thankfully, I don't think there were any reports of injuries or deaths. But we did have a red warning, which means that a lot of businesses were closed or closed temporarily until the storm abated. All the schools were closed. So a lot of people not traveling, which is probably a good thing. When you saw all of the trees that were felled by those very strong winds at uh, 5 a.m this morning i woke up and it was calm not a breath of wind around and it was really calm by six o'clock less actually le in less than an hour it was blowing a gale and uh, i think the worst of it was between sort of six and seven a.m six and eight a.m maybe very bad winds but anyway um so we're all good and um, thank you to those who did express concern, because, you know, from a distance, you might know what's going on. Anyway, um, the main headline on RTE News at the moment is Ireland facing conveyor belt of storms through winter. Not the sort of stuff you want to be reading. But anyway, so uh, apparently that's the first. Let's keep the fingers crossed that they're completely wrong about that, by the way. It was my great pleasure to share a cup of tea with one of our Tua. In Drogheda today, none other than Michael Pike, one of our regular regulars. Michael is also a patron of Mythical Ireland and uh, is uh, in Ireland at the moment and staying here in the fine city of Drogheda, soon to be city. I confidently predict. Apologies. And let me say hello to whoever is in the house. First commenter tonight, shockingly, is not Elaine Dent Lingenfelter. It's Tuesday Thompson. Happy Mythology Monday. Well, happy Monday to you too, Tuesday. Yeah, that sounds funny, doesn't it? Well, it's kind of almost Tuesday, you know. You have a one in seven chance of being right. Uh, Martina Drolin Linsky, good evening, Rainbow. Well, good evening to yourself. And yes, may there be treasure at the end of all your rainbows. Joe Butler is in Colorado. Auntie Joe, good afternoon. I hope all the two are flourishing. Well, hey, yes, with your help, of course, Joe. And uh, yeah, we welcomed another platter of people to the mythical Ireland community on facebook uh we are now up to thirty two thousand seven hundred and thirty two members if you're not on it i'll share the link now feel free to join and join in all of those wonderful conversations uh, thank you joe um who else is in the house wayne bird is here good evening to you wayne wayne i know more than anyone well, probably among all of those Bronze Age patrons who is reading the Return to Sagish Companion volume, which is finished in draft form and which I am sharing uh, two pages at a time with Bronze Age patrons. And the patron address is scrolling there along the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to support Mythical Ireland, become a patron and get access to all that stuff. Wayne, I hope you're in good form and that you didn't get uh, too badly battered by that storm. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is here. Hello, Anthony, and all the two. I hope you are all above water. We're having a pretty day. 18 Celsius. <laughs> yeah. Myself and Michael Pike were laughing about this today, about how it's so true that you guys, some of you people can afford to shave a few degrees off and send them over the Atlantic to us. I think it's, last time I checked uh, earlier, it was 11 Celsius here in Ireland. Let me check. Current temperature at Dublin Airport is 10 Celsius. So you have eight degrees on us there at the moment. Sounds pleasant enough. Not too warm. 
Rex Fortenberry is uh, greeting the weary travelers. Who says they're weary? I'm just silencing my phone. Uh, but good afternoon to you. Ready for some flixin? And of course, uh, when Rex says flixin, he means myth flixin. Think of uh, Netflix and change net to myth, and you've got myth flix. Um, now, uh, Wayne is saying hello to Michael Trott, who I did not see. Anyway, we'll get to it. Lily Shambles made it. Yes. Always, always, always a victory. Uh, Joe Kraus is in the house. Good evening. Good afternoon, Joe. Hope you're in good form. Rick Russell is saying hello from Alabama. Hello, Rick. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. Always a pleasure. Heather Marie Leaning is in the house saying hello to Anthony and Tom King and to I hope you're all well. All in good form, I think. Yeah. Not too storm battered, you know. Barb Jordan is here. Hello, everyone. Glad the storm is over there snowing in the Adirondacks right now. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to say something and I'm going to touch wood while I say it, but we don't usually get much snow in Ireland. Hopefully I haven't tempted fate. Lexi Erickson is in the library. <laughs> she wishes she was in this library. <laughs> no, I suppose you have your own brilliant, uh, fabulously, wonderfully adorned uh, library, I'm sure, Lexi. I think you said that before, um, but you probably wouldn't mind having a nosy around in here anyway. Paula McIlrath is also in the house. Paula, how are you? Good to see you. Good evening to you. I hope you are not too uh, flustered and wind blown after that storm. Desiree Riley is here doing a little cleaning while tuning in. Glad everyone is safe from the storm. Well, glad that you're able to get something done and not just sitting, you know, staring at the screen. Desiree, always a pleasure. And no doubt before too long, we'll hear the doggies uh, saying hello. Tom King is also here. Well, he's in his forge. He's not here, as it were, but here, as in collectively, as in this wonderful place, this wonderful part of the world that we call the Boyne Valley in Ireland's ancient east. Sue Prenter has joined us. It's amazing how calm it is now compared to this morning. Hope everyone well. Yeah. Like at 5 a.m. this morning, it was really calm. But by 6 a.m., you could dry your hair by sticking it out the window for a couple of minutes. Ola Conrad is saying hello from Denmark. Good evening to you, Ola. Good night. Uh, thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to say hello to you. And Tom is saying, hello there, Anthony the Mighty Tua. It's been a busy time at the Forge. Hope all in good fettle. Enjoy the story. Yeah, you were busy. And I see Davo Grin um, and uh, others providing great entertainment and some great pictures there. Catherine Cleary wishes she was in Ireland. Happy to hear you're all okay after the storm. So happy to be a new member of this community. Well, Catherine, you're very welcome. And I'm sure that you'll continue to receive that welcome. Um, and you'll, yeah, what a wonderful community. And uh, welcome to the library. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, pour yourself a dram. Get your feet up. If you need a blanket, because it's cold, you know. A uh, bag of crisps, maybe. Dry roasted peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh, apologies. I won't do that again. Um, <laughs> Mariana Dunn says, Banachty, dear Tua and Anthony, from a beautiful day in Alexandria, Virginia, I voted yes. I vote yes on draw out a city status. Yes. Brilliant stuff, Mariana. We are assured of victory now. Sharon O'Farrell is in the house. Ihoa. Sharon, how are you keeping? I haven't seen you in a while. I hope you've been busy. For all the right reasons, of course. Brendan Byrne is in the house. All the way from Glandalo. Glen of the Two Lakes. The Valley of the Two Lakes in Wicklow. Glen the Lock. There's Michael Trot. Majinwa on show. Vanity August Smacht Racha August Stomacha Aimshire. Good morning. Here, blessings on the rule of law and weather storms. Stoimica. Storm Stormica. Dalshay Scamalock on you. Anocht. Steve Martinson is boasting of 58 Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? 14.4. That's decent. Yeah. This time of year. Steve is in Mon Monona, 
Wisconsin. Good afternoon to you, Steve. Thanks for joining us and saying hello. Uh, and Joe Krause is saying good morning. Uh, it's amazing uh, how we have to say different things to different people. And Michael Trott, of course, is in New Zealand. Uh, Michael Trott. Um, we corresponded by email today, and I didn't respond to your last email, but yes. Brilliant. Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's hope that doesn't start. Um, Brandon is looking forward to this episode. Brilliant. Archaeoastronomy database, who is Ty, says, Greetings, friends. Hello, Ty. A little birdie tells me of your adventures in Scotland. Say nothing. Kathleen Gallagher is saying good afternoon slash good evening. Don't forget good morning for Michael Trott. Kathleen, such a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Marlene, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name. Uh, Marlene, please forgive me. Is it Moshage? Is saying greetings to all from Northern Illinois. A fine autumn afternoon on the prairie. Sounds lovely. Uh, Marlene, thank you for joining us. Not sure if we've seen you before. You're very welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library and uh, this uh, live stream. And uh, make yourself uh, comfortable and hopefully you'll be made feel at home and given a, a nice cave meal of fault. Miriam is, is joining us. Giagrich, looking forward to another session. Missing Ireland. Hey, it's open. Come on back over. <laughs> Says you, I know it's not that easy. Caitlin Moon is shining brightly in Dublin, even though apparently it's the dark moon, is it? Apparently um, it's the new moon. I think that's a terrible... Modern astronomers did a terrible disservice by calling the invisible moon the new moon. The new moon should be the very first crescent, the new moon, you know? Uh, but anyway, Caitlin is a, a radiant full moon at all times, um, even when she's uh, trying to finish her... Uh, PhD. Yeah, zero percent illumination. So uh, the moon is invisible right now, but Caitlin, not invisible. Trinity was closed most of the morning. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of the colleges and universities and schools, secondary schools are closed. Ministry of Minstrels is in Caledonia County, Vermont. Well, a very good afternoon to you. Ministry of Minstrels. Fantastic stuff. Are you um, a uh, a companion ministry of the Ministry of Funny Walks? No. Um, that is, uh, we'll save the Monty Python humour for later. Uh, the dry roasted are addictive. Yes, I can confirm that they are. Sally Siggins is suggesting that Sligo is giving Cavan a run for its money with lakes today. Greetings in the Northwest. Um, did it do a lot of rain, Sally, in Sligo? Will we be writing new myths about the appearance of lakes, you know, which is a feature of uh, mythology. Sally, I'm always a pleasure. And thank you for um, your insights and your 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 work behind the scenes on, on that stuff lately. Um, and I hope you're keeping well. Um, Miriam says, if I'm unable to find work and a visa for Scotland, I actually plan to move to Ireland in the next couple of years. See, it has this draw. You come here and you experience its sacred sites in Ishnock and places like that and Tara and Brunabonia. And it just has this draw. It just says, come here, come on. You know you want to, you know. And Caitlin Moon says, what can I say? I go through phases. I'm full. I just had dinner. <laughs> full moon. <laughs> I love it. And Michael says, hello, hello, Anthony. The two are crisps, peanuts, and fine tunes the other night at Tom's Forge. Hello there, Tom from County Auckland. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, in the Celtic moons, it's the moon of the boar. Well, not the boar, B-O-R-E. Um, I won't bore you this evening. Barbara Murphy is in the house from Tucson, Arizona. Figured out how to listen on the truck radio. Home now or ready to go in. Wow. That's handy, isn't it? Or is it? Do you really want to be listening to me and my terrible jokes while trying to concentrate on getting from A to B and on your on your journey? Um, anyway, I think I'm caught up. 38 millimetres of rain. 
Thank, thankful to live on a hill next to the sea, not too far to drain. Fields are sopping. Potatoes self-washing these days. <laughs> Always look on the bright side, Sally. <laughs> oh, yes. There's another me. Oh, my God. Terrible. We cannot possibly countenance this uh, notion, you know. Um, anyway. Um, when it's not stormy, I love going outdoors. It's far safer than going out windows. Sotanar has joined us. Falche Nadina Bra. August 2 Fain. You're not so unbra yourself, <laughs> even though I've never seen you. Um, how, how, how are you? Burr Whelan has joined us also. Burr, what a pleasure. Just as we're about to start reading. <laughs> what perfect timing. And don't forget the usual. And now for a quick commercial break. Do, 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 Mythical Ireland's 2024 calendar. You must have this on your wall. High quality photography, 300 gram laminated cover, 250, 200 gram, 200 gram uh, 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 gloss uh, pages, full color photography, beautiful images and astronomical information in your calendar you have to put this on your wall you have to get it and to get it it's very easy you just go to the mythical island website which is mythicalireland.com and go to the shop but i'll paste the link in there so it'll make it easy indeed says uh ty Scotland was great, saw many ancient sites. More info to come later. And had the pleasure of meeting up with one of the two. Uh, I know who. I met up with the same member of the two uh, last week, Indrada. <laughs> Fergal says that's a must Christmas present. Thank you, Fergal. I agree. The calendar is gorgeous, says Joe. Got mine, and I'm so happy. Brilliant stuff, Joe. Brilliant. Right, let's get on with it. Absence of legislation is section three of the chapter that we're reading of uh, Social History of Ancient Ireland. This is chapter six, and it's called the Brehm Laws. This is section three called Absence of Legislation. Now, I have a couple of fragments of peanut uh, in my mouth. I'm going to wash them down. With my little bottle of water. <coughs> Whiskey. <coughs> water. Uh, I said water, didn't I? In all countries, a part at least of the law. Where is Michael Pike, by the way? Hmm. In all... <laughs> I'm... I'm shocked, Michael. I'm I'm really shocked. If you're not there, I'm really shocked and disappointed. You know, watching from half a mile away. Hmm. 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 Pardon me. I've just got a very interesting email. I'm not reading it out. Oh, nice. Wow, um, I need to check my calendar. <laughs> Seems that I might be going out in November. Well, I know it is November. I mean, later in November. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Anyway, let me carry on. Lexi says, my calendar has not arrived yet. Did you get uh, in, an email with a tracking number on it, Lexi? You should have. Um, all things working the way they're supposed to work. Um, let me just quickly check. You pre-ordered it too, which means should be there ages ago really uh, 
Yeah, there is a tracking number with it. Fulfilled on the 25th of October. That's kind of like more than two weeks ago. Okay, 27th of October, your post has left on post Dublin Mail Centre, Dublin 12. Hmm. Lexi, if it doesn't arrive like in another week, let me know and I'll send you another one. FOC, you know. We can't have that. Let me uh, start again. Oh, in all countries, a part at least of the law consists of customs that have grown up from the immemorial beginnings of society, corresponding with what is now called common law, never formally enacted, but submitted to by the general body of the people from hereditary habit and under pressure of public opinion. But in countries where the central government has attained sufficient power to take the law into its own hands, there are super added to these a body of laws specially enacted statute law as it is now called josie weatherford is joined uh, is joined josie weatherford has joined us josie what a pleasure good evening to you hope you're in good form not too wind blown excuse me um okay maybe today but come here do let me know as soon as it arrives won't you um the post between ireland and the states can be a bit generally um i correspond quite a lot with some people in the states um and i send a lot of stuff to the states generally it takes around seven to eight days generally uh it can take as little as few as six and it can take as many as several weeks but that's obviously something usually on that side you know Adina Sparks is telling us it is a warm day in New Mexico. That's New Mexico, Albuquerque. Uh, but we had this discussion before, didn't you? You're not in Albuquerque, um, if I remember right. And I probably don't remember right, but then I'm middle-aged. So you can forgive me for that. Um, yeah, I picture New Mexico as being a place where, which is eternally warm and dry. Correct me if I'm wrong. You probably will. You probably tell me it rains half the time. Ireland never arrived at, or at least never seriously entered on, the legislative stage. In other words, no distinct legislative machinery existed. That is to say, a body convened for the purpose of making laws, with authority conferred by the state, and with special officers to enforce obedience, a body like our present parliament. He's writing in 1903, remember, this is before Irish independence and after the act of union hmm. the resistance of the subordinate kings to their nominal superiors and the resulting constant internecine wars rendered it impossible for any supreme king to command sufficient power i was going to say that and i'm glad i didn't it's been said for me ireland was politically fractured very difficult to, to hold a legislature legislature together under those circumstances you know so that the central government was never strong enough to have much influence either in the making of laws or in causing the existing laws to be carried out. All this prevented the idea of the state from taking root, and the people could not look into it, look could not look to it for supreme authority or for protection, much the same as matters stood in England at the time of the Heptarchy. A central state authority would have been ultimately developed in Ireland if the development had not been first retarded by civil strife and finally arrested by the Danish wars and by the Anglo-Norman invasion. Um, yeah, what were the five kingdoms of the Heptarchy? Uh, Northumberland... Mercia, Wessex, and there's more than five there. Heptarchy. That's confusing to me. Uh, I'm looking at maps of the Heptarchy and there's more than five. When I see Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia. Maybe somebody better versed in British history might be able to fill in the blanks for us. It has been asserted indeed that one of the objects for which the Fesh of Tara, Fesh Chauro, 
was convened was to enact laws. But for this assertion, which is often enough repeated, there is no ancient authority. We have very full descriptions of this fesh and also of the proceedings at some of the Enochs or fair meetings held elsewhere. Chapter XXIX. Wow, looking forward to reading chapter XXIX. Which I presume is in volume two. Uh, XXIX would be chapter 29, wouldn't it? Yes. Sorry, seven, not five. Duh. Pent. Uh, yes. Pentarchy would be would be five. Hept is seven. So Northumbria. <laughs> anyway, that's live TV. And the problem with this is it's recorded and you can watch it back. And you can watch all of those embarrassing moments where I've made a complete fool of myself over the years. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Dennis Norden. Yes, indeed. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that, by the way? Um, yes. Uh, Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia. Yes, seven. Thank you, Sotonar, for uh, <laughs> not sparing my blushes, but for, <clears throat> yes, for telling me the truth. And uh, let us let us never shirk from the truth, even if even if it makes us uh, look stupid. Gemma McGowan is in the house. Hi, Anthony. I hope Debbie didn't do too much damage to your place. Hi, Debbie. No, uh, thankfully, Gemma, all in good shape. Hope you're in good form too, and no, uh, not too wind blown. And uh, we didn't even lose power, thankfully, which was great. Ironically, this book was written before the fire at the Four Courts, which took place in the 1920s when independence was finally won. The fire destroyed most of the legal documents from medieval Ireland. Wow. Terrible shame, isn't it? No photocopiers back then. Oh, goodness. It's 1903 already. I have missed a lot, says Mavanway. <laughs> Hello, Mavanway. How are you? Welcome, of course. Welcome, welcome. There are mountains in New, New Mexico, Lexi points out. Well, if there are mountains, it's going to be cold up there, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not right in suggesting that New Mexico is constantly warm and dry. Yes, Albuquerque, been cold this week. Low 40s F. Wow. Mm. Which is four to five degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's cold. Definitely. Karen Faye O'Loughlin is saying, at least I can watch this Mythical Ireland live stream. Been busy every Monday for such a long time here in Boulder, Colorado. We're having a lovely autumn. Well, Karen, what a pleasure to see you. Glad you're having a lovely autumn. And come here, listen. If you can't watch us live, you can watch us after the fact. But it's always nice to be said hello to, isn't it? Um, but anyway. Um, yes, my family, but your luck. That's life, isn't it? You know, we're all, everybody's busy. Barbara Murphy's three years on Duolingo, and I understood the first half of your sentence. Damn, I wish I had a mind for languages. Yeah, well done on three years. Fantastic stuff. Mo Saga. Marlene. Mo Saga. Sounds a bit like a, a storyline about uh, Liverpool. The Mo Saga. Uh -huh. Mo Salah. Never mind. Never mind. A lot of people won't get that reference. And yes, it's very obscure. But earlier I said, Happy Christmas, Dennis Norton. Anybody pick up on that? No. Nobody. Not one of you. I'm surprised. We have a very full description of this fashion, also the proceedings at some of the Anux and fair meetings held, held elsewhere. But though we find it stated over and over again that at these assemblies, the laws were publicly proclaimed or promulgated or rehearsed to make the people familiar with them, that they were revised or rearranged or reaffirmed, these several functions being always performed by properly qualified lawyers, there is nowhere any open or enacted and sent forth with authority either at the Fesh or at any of the Anux. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. As a matter of fact, O'Curry, though he believed the Fesh at Tara exercised legislative functions in their widest sense, acknowledges that he was unable to find any record of the enactment of any particular law at these Tara conventions. <sighs> Sorry, I'm going to fall asleep here you're all boring me uh, of course not <laughs> is the humor getting more subtle uh, asks uh, Mavon. and that wasn't very subtle was it yes it's impossible to say the extent of what was lost says caitlin and what can be restored i recently dealt with this problem in my research brilliant stuff 
hopefully you'll be able to bring some of it back you know have those lost documents not been restored now as copies of the documents excuse me have been returned as multiple copies were made around the world brendan says yeah most of nm is though says marie is mountainous or is dry and hot i presume it's dry and hot let me just rabbit hole new mexico climate New Mexico has a mild, arid, or semi-arid continental climate characterized by light precipitation totals, abundant sunshine, low relative humidities, and relatively large annual and diurnal temperature range. The highest mountains have climate characteristics common to the Rocky Mountains. Wow, there you go. And that's from New Mexico State University. I've almost completed a year trying Duolingo, yet we know it's a challenging language changa mm. yeah it's challenging for me i learned it in school and i still can't speak it bring out the ferret <laughs> joe butler has the rabbit hole symbols up on the screen already <laughs> somebody somebody got the timer <laughs> took us a while longer this week than i think it was the 35 seconds last week by the time we went down a rabbit hole no let's let's be frank here and speak the truth it was 35 seconds before I went down a rabbit hole and insisted on dragging you all down there with me. From the earliest times, however, assemblies were con convened to deliberate on public questions. Matters of local and general interest were discussed and arranged, such as taxes, generally, uh, sorry, and making uh, the making and repairing of roads, sounds like a council meeting, bridges, causeways, boundaries, the rights of classes or tribes and such like, but this was not legislation. Yet some of these meetings made an approach to legis legislative functions, as, for instance, the Synod convened at Tara in 697, where, under the influence of alcohol, <laughs> I'm joking, under the influence of St. Adavnon, the law exempting women from taking part in war was agreed on and promulgated. Wow. And what if the woman wanted to take part in the war? Was she allowed? I hope so. We have fierce warrior women in Irish uh, mythology, of course. It is not necessary to quote other examples here, but those who wish to study the matter further will find in the footnote many other references to records of such assemblies. Brehan Laws 137, 79 and 81, 159, 22. 321 last perfect wow four masters ad 1050 meeting at killaloo o'curry ms matt man and custom woman wow yes if you wanted to go down that rabbit hole i do not helen hurst chader has joined us good afternoon helen what a pleasure and uh, she says apologies we're having high winds and my internet feed is glitchy we'll catch up on the replay yeah we had a, a storm this morning uh very early this morning uh between six and sort of nine or ten o'clock a lot of trees down but thankfully nobody hurt um yeah sotonar makes a point it is true duolingo is kind of handy to a point but there are better ways to actually learn to speak the language you know um anyway I'm just making sure i've caught up on everybody yes Meetings of this kind at best bore only a faint resemblance to legislative assemblies, for there existed no authoritative machinery to have the laws carried out, and anyone who chose might refuse to obey them without subjecting himself to any danger of direct punishment by the state. But these historical considerations do not go to the bottom of the subject. The real way to determine the question is to examine the laws themselves. When we do this, we find a, sca a scarce we find scarce a trace of any result of legislative action. Nothing at all, in fact, resembling statute law. The entire book of Ackle, which occupies nearly one large volume of the Brehan Laws, and which to some extent corresponds, as has been said, to the present British criminal law, consists, as the book itself states, of precedents, precedents the legal pronouncements of two learned lawyers, Cormac MacArt and Cainfile the Learned. Ken Fela, the learned. As to the Shamachus Moor, 
the most important part of the whole Brehem Code. It seems to be merely a revised edition, as already stated, of the old pagan law in use before the time of St. Patrick, of which there is no record and no indication that any part was ever enacted by a legislative authority. Of course, as with all these things, absence of evidence does not mean, uh, does not signify uh, um, uh, evidence of absence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Yes, indeed. To what an extent the judgments of the Brehans were regulated by mere precedent or case law is very clearly expressed in Cormac's glossary under the word fasach. Fasach, a precedent or maxim, i.e. the Brehan produces a precedent, uh, koshmailis, C-O-S-M-A-I-L-E-S, koshmailis, literally a likeness for every case in which he adjudicates, i.e. a case similar, koshmail, to another, and he afterwards repeats the sentence which wise Brehans had passed upon it, i.e. upon a case similar to the case in hands. Or he follows a good old judgment for the present case. <clears throat> so also, the commentary on the Shanachus Moor says the Brehan delivered judgment in public form, sorry, in public from the precedents or, and commentaries or the precedents, if you prefer. Laws without consensus, that's not good. Janet Moran, tuning in, finally, busy, busy. Hope everyone on your side of the ocean survived the storm. Yeah, we did, thankfully. A lot of trees down, but nobody hurt, it looks like. Hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm correct on that. Josie says the law excluding women from war was referred to as the law protecting the, uh, the, the law protecting of innocence and was also thought of as being very liberal at the time because it protected women and also clerics from battle. Yeah, when was that enacted? I'm just wondering because... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. 697. That was before the uh, the Norse invasion, before the Vikings. Mm, interesting. Although the assumption is from the church that women didn't want to be in battle. A big assumption. <laughs> yes. The church has kind of a history of assuming things about women, doesn't it? Yes. Northman, hello, how are you? You send today very nice... 180 shot of oh new range yes indeed if you haven't seen it this is part of what i hope will be a longer video well, i shot lots of footage on saturday uh, at bruna bonia and uh, yeah i made a short but i want to make a longer one when i get time that is i'm just sharing the link there to the youtube video um yeah so 180 pan around new grange yeah nice day for it too the calm before the storm as they say Apologies. Go to bed. The Brehan laws, then, are not a legislative structure, but merely a collection of customs attaining the force of law by strong, sorry, by long usage, by hereditary habit, and by public opinion. Customs which were thrown into shape and committed by writing to writing by a class of professional lawyers or Brehans. And a similar growth and development of custom law took place in the early stages of all the Aryan nations. It is to be observed that after the time of St. Patrick in the 5th century, Christianity exerted an ever-increasing influence in law, as in other institutions. And it is evident from the law books that, while custom was the main guide of the Breton lawyers, moral right and wrong obtained more and more consideration in the settlement of cases as time went on. And the next section is called Suitability of the Brehan Law. How are we all doing? Evania Lee is in Tuesday, while, while most of us are in, in uh, Monday. Evania, good morning. And hello to all our good folk in uh, New Zealand. And the southern hemisphere uh what a pleasure to say hello to you again hope you're in good form mark gordon has joined us uh, mark is i think in iowa that's where he usually says hello from mark good afternoon to you uh, olas makes a good point i don't understand the social laws of war in the ongoing wars this one particular act is against the laws of war shouldn't it be forbidden to make war at all yes uh war isn't war just legalized murder you know really yeah it's terrible the subtitles right now are saying buy me a coffee 
yeah uh become a patron uh i hope also um yeah from uh, outlaw war, war altogether section four suitability of the brehan law the brehan code forms a great body of civil military and criminal law it regulates the various ranks of society i'm struggling now at the awning from the king down to the slave and enumerates their several rights and privileges there are minute rules for the management of property for the several industries building brewing mills water courses fishing weirs bees and honey for distress or seizure of goods for tithes trespass and evidence the relations of landlord and tenant the fees of professional men doctors judges teachers builders artificers the mutual duties of father and son of foster parents and foster children of master and servant are all carefully regulated in that portion corresponding to what is now known as criminal law the various offenses are minutely distinguished murder manslaughter assaults wounding thefts and all sorts of willful damage and accidental injuries from flails sledgehammers machines and weapons of all kinds and the amount of compensation is laid down in detail for almost every possible variety of injury yeah uh, the one thing about the brown laws that makes them fascinating is the exhaustive nature of the detail you know contracts or covenants are regarded as peculiarly 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 sacred and are treated in great detail there are three periods of evil for the world says the shamachas more the period of a plague uh, of a general war and of the dissolution of verbal contracts and again the world would be evilly situated if express contracts were not binding but they should be contracts in which both parties were perfectly free a condition always very clearly kept in view there were several ways of striking a contract or ratifying a covenant all very simple one was by the two parties joining their right hands which would which should be first ungloved if gloves were worn sometimes one of the parties put his drinking horn into the hand of the other careful now his head drinking horn a practice anciently common in england especially in the transfer of lands certain legal formulae were commonly used oh formulae a e joined together what is that called when two letters encyclopedia p a e d i a what is that called there's a technical term for it. i'll give you two seconds and then i'm going to just say it out loud i love that word i think it's brilliant um it's like a, a, a ligature is one form but that's not the word i'm looking for i'm not looking looking for ligature i'm looking for the other word oh, brilliant word yay thank you sue printer <laughs> diphthong thank you my family yes diphthong yes ah obscure well it's not it's probably obscure to most people you know the diphthong yeah well done Mavanwe. first prize of an extra 10 minutes of dad jokes uh, if women participated in battle they were on the front lines as slaves while women can be warriors in mythology their status under the breton law was extremely different it is documented that they had, they had very limited legal agency and essentially had the legal status of children yeah Boy, doesn't that surprise me uh, lynn murphy is saying evening mr murphy good evening ms murphy i hope you're well oh dear doesn't grammar rock yes diphthong love it certain legal formulae ae with the diphthong were commonly used the conditions were to be observed quote while the sea surrounds aaron unquote quote so long as the sun and wind remain unquote uh, uh, et, uh, et cetera. important contracts were always witnessed 
and it was usual to give on each side persons of standing uh, as securities and guarantees for the fulfillment of contracts uh, or conditions. These persons became liable in case of default. A contract was denoted by the words cor copac and I think it's Ernaim, E R N A I D M, I think. It's very just difficult to see. Ernaim. Lynn is fine. Brilliant stuff, Lynn. I'm not sure where you are. Are we saying good evening to you or good afternoon or good morning or good night? Not sure. But anyway, Lynn, uh, you're very welcome. I, it's always a great pleasure to welcome and yet another Murphy into the uh, Mythical Ireland Library. The Brehan Law was vehemently condemned by English writers, and in several Acts of Parliament it was made treason for the English settlers to use it. But these testimonies are to be received with much reserve as coming from prejudiced and interested parties. The laws laid down in the Brehan Code were not, in fact, peculiarly Irish. They were, as has been remarked, similar to the ancient laws of all other Aryan tribes, a survival modified by time and circumstance of what was once universal. We have good reason to believe that the Brehan Law was very well suited to the society in which and from which it grew up. This view is confirmed by the well-known fact that when the English settlers living outside the Pale adopted the Irish manners and customs, they all, both high and low, abandoned their own law and adopted the Brehan Code, to which they became quite as much attached as the Irish themselves. The Anglo-Irish lords of those times commonly kept Brehans in their service after the manner of the native Irish chiefs, although it was treason for them to do so, <coughs> and even the butlers, who of all the great Anglo-Irish families were least inclined to imitate the Irish, adopted the custom. Many authorities might be cited in proof of all this, but the following passage from an Anglo-Irish state paper of 1537 sets forth the facts as clearly and as strongly as could be desired. Quote, Mem. The statutes of Kilcas, i.e. the local Brehan law of Kilcash in Tipperary near Clonmel, be commonly used in the country by the Lord of Ossery, one of the butlers, and by his Irish judge called Abraham, and by all other freeholders of the country, and they have none other law but the same, and divers of the books of the same statutes, i.e. manuscript books of these parts of the Brehan law, are in the safekeeping of the sheriff of the Shire of Kilkenny, the Shire. <laughs> All I see is just little people that emerging out of sort of grassy mounds down in Kilkenny, smoking sort of weed and long pipes. The Shire of Kilkenny, the Principality of the Earls of Ormond, Chiefs of the Butlers, and the Bishop of Waterford, and one book is in possession of Rory McLoira. L-O-U-G-H-I-R-E. Is that McLeira? Rory, Rory, what do you... No, that's much, much, much... Yes, sorry, this is a, a millennium after that, Lera. Being judge or brehan of the, of the country, unquote. And that ends that chapter. We will continue, of course. But anyway, I agree. Caitlin is a font of knowledge. She certainly is. Bums up. Is it time for weed now, says Rex? <laughs> Whatever you have in yourself. <laughs> Come here. Let me just tell you, I'm not your minder, right? Whatever you do within your own four walls, in your own house, is your own business, you know? <laughs> Deborah Gilbert is a little bit late, but happy to be with you. Well, we're happy that you've joined us, Deborah, as always, and a great pleasure to say hello to you. That also contributed to why the Irish hated the Vikings. Irish women liked the Viking men too much. They practiced better personal hygiene and treated their wives better. Well, I mean, wow, yeah, incredible. Uh, and Mavanwe says, I think Welsh women had more rights under the law of Hwilda, uh, from what I remember, uh, gross misrepresentation of the pronunciation. Samantha Healy, evening to you and welcome. Lynn Murphy tells us she is in England, London. Well, brilliant. Uh, good old London town. You, uh, you get a shiver in the dark. It's raining in the park, but meantime, sat at the river, you stop and you hold everything. A band is blowing, Dixie. 
double thought time. Feel all right when you hear the music. And uh, London, uh, in London town, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Speaking of contracts, how was marriage viewed? Is it similar to becoming one flesh, but with a contract to deal with property and divorce? I think we're going to get to that because there's actually three chapters about um, the Brehan laws. And the second was about military system and law. I wonder, the administration of justice then is the third one. Did we cover that? Not really sure. It's a good question though, Mark. Very good question. Yes, they also talk about it in Dublinia if you get a chance to visit. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, something else. Nobody came back to me on Happy Christmas, Dennis Norton. I made a, a boo-boo. Uh, what you would call an outtake, right? Um, there used to be a program on... Well, it was British TV, but like we had four channels here in Ireland in the 80s, uh, RTE1, RTE2, and uh, BBC1 and BBC2. We later had Channel 4 on UTV as well, but uh, we didn't have much to watch. Um, what was the name of it? It was, it, was, it was just featured outtakes, which when it first aired, it was really unusual because you know, we, we weren't used to seeing outtakes in movies and, and TV programs. Um, not whose line is it anyway? What was it called? Um, it'll be all right on the night. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Burr. Oh, apologies. Apparently I missed something. Oh, I do apologize. Burr, certainly, uh, it'll be all right on the night. And Lily Shamble says, yes, I did. Or or e all right on the night. Okay, so I apologize. Um, I I, I must have missed that. Um, but uh, while filming, the young ones or bottom, Rick Mail when he made uh, some mistakes with his script, would look at the camera and go, "Merry Christmas, Dennis Norton," because he knew that the outtake would likely end up on Dennis Norton's TV program. I'm glad that somebody else knows that. I feel that that it's a rather obscure piece of information, and now suddenly it feels as if the world is a much bigger place, and and I'm not the only nerd out there, you know. Karen says, speaking of diphthongs, and um, we're re-entering the rabbit hole here, folks. In American English, we vocalize diphthongs at, at the end of many many words, i.e., Monday and so forth. Wow didn't know that ah good old rick mail yeah god rest him yeah anthony you have watched too much tv and apparently i've read too many books so what should i do <laughs> go out and take more pictures i suppose the lava tunnel is being monitored obviously very carefully says samantha Conceived in Carrick, Fergus, and lived there, but I still go to Ireland, but not the North. Um, what are the lyrics uh, to that famous song? Oh, I was in Carrick, Fergus. I, I don't know the lyrics, but I know the tune because I have uh, played it on the euphonium. Um, why don't we just look up? You probably don't want to know. I know, right? You're probably like, no, Anthony, don't start singing. I wish I was in Carrick Fergus, holy for night in Ballygrand. I would swim over the deepest ocean, the deepest ocean for my love to find, and all that. <laughs> How do you fix a brass instrument with a tuba glue? <laughs> but um, ah, yes, here come all the brass band jokes now. <laughs> uh, can I tell a bold one? <laughs> what? 
What's the difference between a bull and a brass band? The bull has the horns at the front and the asshole at the back. <laughs> oh, that's an old one. Uh, old but gold. Yes, indeed. <laughs> there is no possibility of reading too many books, says Barbara. Now, acting them out is a very different story. Yeah. Um, the last book that I read sort of in full was It by Stephen King. Not about to act it out. No, definitely not. And I've been reading the Aeneid, believe it or not. Yes, I know. Hardy har har, says Karen. <laughs> uh, you could use that joke for an orchestra as well, by the way. You know. Uh, this is chapter seven, the laws relating to land. Is everybody in good form? It's a beautiful song. Yes, sing. Yeah. Um, and there's so many different versions of it, you know. It is a nice song. I do agree. Samantha is saying Reykjavik is about an hour or so away. And Scott Doherty forgot what day it was. How could you possibly... How did you manage that? I'm very late. Well, better late than never. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives. She arrives. No. Been reading The Cry of the Sabbath by Anthony. Or if you prefer the modern pronunciation, the Shawak. Um, yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Hmm. Give me one moment. I hope I'm not having internet problems. Because saying that the page isn't loading who's the, what did we blow it is that the brass band joke oh. hmm. apparently mythical ireland is down so when it's back up go to shop and books and the cry of the sabbath is there and mccallum is here hello to anton and all the mighty to uh, sorry to miss the live stream just popping in to say hello and that I hope everyone's doing well and that you enjoy story time. All the crack and the dad jokes. Yes, we just had a few of those. Looking forward to catching up later. By the way, it's a lovely sunny wind free 15 Celsius today. Brilliant stuff, Anne. And hello and good afternoon to you. And uh, yeah, uh, lovely to see you as always. And uh, enjoy the replay, including the very, very poor jokes. But, you know. The land originally... The land originally common property. This is section one. The following account of the ancient land laws of Ireland, which has been compiled chiefly from the Breton laws, is corroborated in some of its main features by those early English writers who described the native Irish customs from personal observation. It throws much light on the Irish land question of modern times. In theory, the land belonged not to individuals, but to the tribe. The king or chief had a portion assigned to him as mensal land. The rest was occupied by the tribesmen in the several ways mentioned below. The chief, though exercising a sort of supervision over the whole of the territory, had no right of ownership except over his own property, if he had any, and for the time being over his mensal land. It would appear that originally, in prehistoric times, the land was all common property, and chief and people were liable to be called on to give up their portions for a new distribution. But as time went on, this custom was gradually broken in upon and the lands held by some, being never resumed, came to be looked upon as private property. And that's the way it's been ever since. As far back as our records go, there was some private ownership in land and it is plainly recognised through all the Brehan laws. All, quote, all the Brehan writers seem to have a, bi a bias towards private as distinguished from collective property unquote yet the original idea of collective ownership was never quite lost for although men owned land the ownership was not so absolute as at present a man for instance could not alienate his land outside the tribe and he had to comply with certain other tribal obligations in the management and disposal of it all which restrictions were vestiges of the old tribe ownership 
But within these limits, which were not very stringent, a man might dispose of his land just as he pleased. Outside of the Breton laws, we do not find much reference to the former common occupation of land. But there are at least two passages which have been noticed by Sir Henry Mayne uh, as preserving a dim memory of the old state of things. And I presume Ankh Inst is uh, uh, short for ancient institutions. Interesting passages supplied to him by Dr. Whitley Stokes, who we've met uh, previously in, uh, well, in lots of episodes. One is an ancient scholiast's preference in the book of hymns quote for the people were very numerous in Erin at that time namely during the reign of the sons of Aid Slania AD 656 to 664 and so great were their numbers that the land could afford but thrice nine ridges three mi imere meaning here long narrow plots not hill ridges to, <coughs> to each man in Erin viz. nine of bog, nine of field, and nine of wood. The other passage is in one of the ancient tales, the birth of Cuchulain in the book of the Dun Cow, and copied into that AD 1100 from an earlier manuscript. This story relates how, on one occasion, a party of the Red, Red Branch Knights set out southwards from Owen in chariots in pursuit of a flock of enchanted birds, of course, they ended up at Newgrange, and they proceeded across country without difficulty because, says the story, quote, there was neither trench nor fence nor stone wall round land in those days until there came the time of the sons of Aid Slania, but only smooth fields. Because of the abundance of households in their time, therefore, it came to pass that they made boundaries in Ireland, unquote. Main remarks. Sheila Gunn has joined us late. That's okay. Better late than ever. What a pleasure to say hello to you, Sheila. Hope you're in good form. Um, yeah. Can anybody else access mythicalireland.com? It's telling me right now there was a problem loading this website and it's not appearing to me. Is that just me or is that more widespread. Maybe some of you might check. Main remarks. It is instructive that in both passages, the change is referred to an increase of population. And he goes on to express his opinion that this unquestionably represents true history. The common occupation of land is also alluded to in the early memoirs of St. Patrick. Five ways of holding land is section two. It's not loading for me, says uh, the one way. Yeah, that's a problem. Mm. All good here, says Ulla. Mm. That's a funny one because I can actually log into the, uh, the back end and see the stats and all of that, but I just can't see the website itself. Strange, strange, something going on. Hope that doesn't last long. It hasn't happened uh, since I moved to Shopify, which was on the last day of September last year. I haven't had, not that I've ever noticed. I've never had a, a, a time when the access, uh, page, the website wasn't accessible. So it's down for Mavanway. It's down for Joe. Mavanway, you're in Wales, I think. Joe's in Colorado. It's down in Dublin with Caitlin. Uh, Martin Hodgins is in the house. Hello, Martin. Gia Glitch. Makara, come as thought to. I think we'll go, what time is it? We'll, well, we'll read this section and maybe a bit of the next one. But sure, look, we'll keep going for the moment. I'm in Bristol today, says my man. Close enough, says you, huh? Just the other side of the channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. But yeah, this is, um, hmm. anyway, a little bit disconcerting. Uh, you kind of hope that when your website's down that you're going to be given warning of it. Uh, Anyway, hopefully it doesn't last long. Within historic times, the following were the rules of land tenure as set forth chiefly in the Brehan Laws and also in some important points by early English writers. The tribe or aggregate of tribes under the rule of one king or chief held permanently a definite district of the country. The tribe was divided, as already described, into smaller groups, <coughs> clans or septs, each of which being governed 
by a sub chief under the chief of the tribe was a sort of miniature of the whole tribe and each clan was permanently settled down on a separate portion of the land which was considered as their separate property and which was not interfered with by any other clans or septs of the tribe the land was held by individuals in some one of five different ways and here we go first the chief whether of the tribe or of the sept held a portion of mensal land for life or for as long as he remained chief Helen Marie says down for me too in Lincolnshire not loading says Mariana hmm. How am I supposed to order a calendar if it's down, says Kate? Actually, believe it or not, you can just send me a Facebook message and send me uh, the money on PayPal and just give me your address. <laughs> you don't actually have to order it through the website, but yeah, it's a bit annoying. Uh, and funny enough, uh, looking at the analytics live view, it's saying that there are no visitors right now, which means that, well, you can't have any visitors if your website's in. Oh, it's back here. Yay! Uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about the cry. Oh, no, it was back. <laughs> it was back for me and now it's gone again. No, this is not good. Anyway, uh, the homepage is back, but maybe that's a cached version. Um, yeah. So there are some issues. All right. Thank heavens. As that's the only way I joined the tour, says Barbara. So first, the chief, whether of the tribe or of the sept, held a portion of Bensal land for life or as long as he remained chief. Second, another portion was held as private property by persons who had come to own the land in various ways. Most of these were the flaws or nobles of the several ranks, and some were professional men, such as physicians, judges, poets, historians, art artificers, etc. Artificers. I always have difficulty with that uh, word. Um, a bit like that other word peculiarly that I had a, a difficulty with earlier who had got their lands as stipends or stipends uh, for their professional services to the chief and in whose families it often remained for generations under this second heading may be included the plot on which stood the homestead of every free member of the tribe with the homestead itself stipend I, it got back in denver i think is that the website back in cork too says morris hello morris i was down in cork the weekend before last had a great time clonic hilty brilliant the Samhain festival down there myself and moncom mcgann um just a reminder that there will be a video of that podcast interview uh hopefully in the next couple of weeks i am sitting says ulla and making a drawing of a dolman at this moment, thinking of how it must have been in those times. Fantastic. Love to see that drawing. Are you on Mythical Ireland Creatives on Facebook? Don't forget to join that because that's a great place to share work that's sort of inspired by all the various themes of Mythical Ireland. I am terribly sorry for the yawning. Really, I am. Uh, let me just thank you, Lexi. And I'm just sharing a link to the uh, Mythical Ireland uh, creatives group there. The home page is back, but not the interior pages. Yeah, that's what I'm experiencing. So it just seems that uh, there is a bit of a technical issue at the moment. And uh, ah, the books page has loaded. Will the cry of the Sebuk page load it? No, it won't. Okay, well, sure, we'll give it. A, we'll give it a few minutes. So anyway, if you want to have a look at the books, uh, I'll just paste that link there. Third, persons held as tenants portions of the lands belonging to those who owned it as private property or portions of the mensal land of the chief much like tenants of the present day these paid what was equivalent to rent always in kind the term was commonly seven years and they might sublet to under tenants and uh, pretty sure saskia needs to go out so sometimes i think they like uh, They don't want to disturb me but i don't mind because if she needs to go out she needs to go out 
you know. Fourth, the rest of the arable land, which was called the tribe land, equivalent to the folk, F-O-L-C, or folk land of England, forming by far the largest part of the territory, belonged to the people in general, the several subdivisions of it to the several septs, no part being private property. This was occupied by the free members of the sept who were owners for the time being, each of his own farm. Every free man had a right to his share, a right never questioned. Hello, Coda. Welcome to the live stream. Hello, Saskia. Who needs to go out? Coda says hello. And Joe is reporting that the Mythical Ireland website pages are working fine now. Yes, indeed. Brilliant. Whoo! That doesn't happen very often. Uh, thankfully, there's the cry of the Sebok link there now. Coda! Every free man had a right to his share, a right never questioned. Those who occupied the tribe land did not hold for any fixed term, for the land of the sept was liable to gravel kind or redistribution from time to time, once every two to three years. Yet they were not tenants at will, for they could not be disturbed till the time of gra gaveling. Sorry, it's gavel, gavel kind, not ga gravel, gavel kind, uh, gaveling. Each, uh, even then, each man kept his crops and got compensation for unexhausted improvements. And though he gave up one farm, he always got another. Fifth, the non-arable or wasteland, mountain, forest, bog, etc., was commons land. This was not appropriated by individuals, but every free man had a right to use it for grazing of his sheep and cattle, I presume. He's not going to graze it himself. For procuring fuel or for the chase. There was no need of subdividing the commons by fences, for the cattle of all grazed over it without distinction. The portion of territory occupied by each sept commonly included land held in all the five ways here described. Between common clan ownership on the one hand and private ownership by individuals on the other, there was an intermediate link, for in some cases land was owned by a family, though not by any individual member, and remained in the same family for generations. This was often the case with land granted for professional services. A very remarkable and peculiar development of family ownership was what was known as the Gelfine system, under which four groups of persons, all nearly related to each other, held four adjacent tracts of land as a sort of common property, subject to regulations, then well recognised, but now hard enough to understand. It should be observed that the individuals and families who owned land as private property were comparatively few and their possessions were not extensive. The great bulk of both people and land fell under the conditions of tenure described under the fourth and fifth headings. Still quite a bit to go in that chapter, so I shall leave it there for the time being. Uh, and just to say, um, Avanway is just mentioning it there. Um, I didn't say it at the outset, but uh, it was, of course, uh, a great sadness uh, to hear about the passing of Martin Brennan. And so a few words about Martin to close out this evening's episode. Uh, we have, I have certainly spoken about Martin on many occasions on these live streams and uh, his contribution to our understanding of Neolithic monuments in Ireland, particularly in relation to the astronomical alignments, is immense. He and his close friends and colleagues, particularly Toby Hall and Jack Roberts, I made significant discoveries here. And uh, uh, this was uh, over 40 years ago in the 1980s and um, kind of culminated, well, Martin's first book was the Boyne Valley Vision, and he later admitted that that book was sort of based on a lot of theory. Uh, and the criticism from the establishment archaeologists was that, well, it's all theoretical. And so then uh, Martin and his friends formed a group uh, which had 
I don't think it was ever like a real formal association. I think it was an informal group, but they called themselves Stonelight. And uh, they made a concerted effort to look at uh, the alignments of lots of Irish megalithic passage tombs, uh, Loch Crew and Brunabonia and others. And um, well, that culminated in the publication of what was first called The Stars and the Stones, Ancient Art and Astronomy in Ireland, published originally in 1983, which is 40 years ago uh, this year. Um, first published uh, in London, um, first published by Thames and Hudson, and then published in the USA in 1984. That was later um, uh, re uh, packaged as it were um that later was retitled and became the stones of time there's the same book inside the stars and the stones is what it was originally called and it later became the stones of time um yeah and uh, so brennan's contribution to um irish archaeology irish uh archaeoastronomy was very important although he 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 uh did not use that term himself. He said his special specialization was not archaeoastronomy, it was art. He had studied at the Pratt Institute in New York. He was born in Brooklyn uh, to Irish parents who had moved to New York from Roscommon, County Roscommon. And uh, he had gone to Japan, and in Japan it had been suggested to him. He studied martial arts, per particularly one called Aikido, and he set up an Aikido school while he was in Ireland. But when he was in Japan, it was suggested to him that he go back to his ancestral homeland. And he felt a sort of a calling. And while he was here, as I say, he made significant discoveries. Ireland in the early 80s was a much more conservative country than it is now. I'm not making excuses for what happened. There was quite a, a lot of rancor between the Stonelight group and the academic archaeologists. The archaeologists weren't ready for what Martin Brennan and his team were revealing in relation to the astronomy. Um, and it wasn't a huge factor in their in their work, although one could argue that it was a huge factor in O'Kelly's work at Newgrange, since O'Kelly had restored the roof box and had allowed the sun to shine into the chamber of Newgrange once again. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps, um, as usual, I'm perhaps uh, having an argument with myself, <laughs> contradicting myself as always. Anyway, Martin was 81 at the time of his passing. He had spent a long number of years in Mexico. He had left Ireland. Um, I don't know exactly the year and some of his friends will be able to tell me. I think it was 1984. Under a cloud, um, um, uh, he he uh, he fled Ireland uh, under under threat of law um, at the time. Look, he was a bit. Shall we say that it his his. Uh, I brought Martin back to Ireland in two thousand and nine. It was the only time he was back in Ireland after that. It's the only one time in his life after he left Ireland in nineteen eighty four that he came back. He had left under a cloud and he'd left under, you know, threat of law because because of certain things. And he, <laughs> the word is that he was fond of certain narcotic substances at the time. And as I said, Ireland was a very uh, conservative country at the time. But I think that was just a good excuse, um, you know, um, to get this brash young Irish American off the scene, you know. Um, and it's it's unfortunate what happened. However, over the years, uh, I would say relations between Martin and the establishment thawed. And uh, when he came to Ireland, um, a lot of that had been sort of left behind, which was great. Um, that was 2009. We held a conference in his honour at the Newgrange Lodge here, a few miles from where I'm sitting, uh, called the Boyne Valley Revision, because Brennan's first book was the Boyne Valley vision um and of course he was a visionary but as as uh, with so many people who are visionary brennan had his flaws um uh, he would say he, he would have acknowledged himself that as a younger man he was much more shall we say bulgy ornery um inclined to be uh, contrary with uh, anybody who sort of stood in the way and he was much more sort of laid back and contrite and mature about things in, in later years. But despite the faults, and we all have them, I mean, Jesus, anybody, 
you know, we're all human at the end of the day, right? I have my own flaws. and perfectly willing to admit that. Um, but despite all that, uh, I think Brennan will be remembered for the right reasons. History will be kind uh, to Brennan and to the likes of Jack Roberts and Toby Hall. Jack Roberts continues to be uh, a researcher. He's published a lot of work about stone circles and alignments and sacred sites in Ireland. Uh, he and I became friends after the Boyne Valley Revision Conference. I hadn't known Jack before that. Uh, Toby, who lives abroad, uh, as I say, very close to Martin through the latter years of his life, he had spent a long time in uh, Mexico studying uh, the uh, the Mayan uh, symbols and had found some similarities there uh, between what he found in Mexico and what he had found in Ireland. Um, I'm not sure there was a work published at some point, but I think he, he, there's a lot of unpublished work, basically. Martin uh, was um, something of a Luddite, but a really, in a good way, he lived off the grid. He never owned a computer. He never owned a cell phone. So uh, staying in touch with Martin was quite a challenge. And in fact, I remember that uh, trying to contact him in relation to bringing him to Ireland in 2009 was quite a challenge because that had to happen through several intermediaries. He wrote everything in a beautiful sort of cursive longhand writing. Uh, he never he never even had it seems he never even used a typewriter everything was handwritten and uh, the most beautiful handwriting i'm very lucky uh to have in my possession some of his writing and some of his correspondence and um, that was gifted to me by one of his friends and um, and you can see that uh, lovely uh cursive handwriting um it was an interesting time in the uncovering of the past. The archaeologists, I think, in fairness to them, uh, you know, were real experts at what they did, and there's no question about that. But I think that they weren't perhaps just ready for this uh, this movement, as it were, uh, this this thing of looking at more than just the archaeology and, and the dates and the constitution of monuments looking at the sacred aspects of them and how that may have tied in with uh, cosmological concerns and uh, uh, specifically astronomical alignments. Martin Brennan, being an artist, made all his own drawings of all the megalithic art, not just at Brunabonia and Loch Crew, but actually covered pretty much the whole of Ireland. The only other person, by the way, to have achieved that was Elizabeth Sheed Tuig, who is the um, renowned expert on Irish megalithic art. Um, so Brennan came at it, as I said, as an artist. He would have said, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm not an archaeoastronomer. Um, but he still, as I say, made some very, very important contributions. The alignment towards the equinox sunrises of Cairn T and the tracking of the sun's movements by the other Cairns at Loch Crew, um, a part of his work. I could speak for hours about Martin, uh, except to say that when he came to Ireland, um, there was a handshake that took place on winter solstice 2009 in the Brunabonia Visitor Centre between Martin Brennan and pr the late Professor George Ogan, who had excavated Nouth. And at that moment, I felt that a hatchet had been buried and the past was in the past and it was all done with. And here were two uh, uh, elder statesmen, two older gentlemen who were just reconciling and just saying, look, the past is in the past. And for me personally, that was the most wonderful moment. That and seeing... Uh, Brennan walk into the New Grange Lodge for the first time and see Toby and Jack for the first time in a quarter of a century. It was an emotional reunion that that was lovely to witness. Uh, but uh, the handshake with with George uh, was very special too. And I don't want to particularly carry on the rancor and to focus on that because there are lots of people today who want to focus on uh, on rancor and controversy. And I'm just not one of those. I just don't think that it sort of serves any great purpose. However, I would, uh, I, I do believe it's important that history records, um, you know, that uh, stone light were not popular at the time. And their ideas still today uh, are uh, balked at and uh, still somewhat controversial. Um, and uh, they still don't get the credit for their discoveries that they uh, should really get. You know at this stage anyway i'm going to just catch up to see if there's any uh, comments um lexi studied rock art all her life and there are many coincidences between irish and southwestern us rock art they weren't ready for martin yet absolutely 
Yeah, uh, and that's not to say he was flawless. He he admitted himself, I think, in later years that the, the Boyne Valley vision was very tentative and, and very theoretical. Stars and the Stones is a much, much more solid work. And uh, it, it it is a reference book for a lot of people who study Irish megaliths. And, and rightly so. It, it still it stands the test of time. It's 40 years old and it's still refreshing and it's still eye opening and still brilliant. Uh, Brennan, despite his flaws, uh, was was I believe a visionary man and, and a, a, a very important um, scholar to give him his due. And uh, he rescued the reputations of people like Charles Valancy. He spoke very highly of General Valancy, who had been castigated and ridiculed by the establishment for generations. He got a lot of things wrong, of course, as a linguist. Uh, but Valancy was closer to a deeper truth about astronomical alignments, and, and Brennan recognised that. And as I say, perhaps in the fullness of time, Brennan will get due recognition. He certainly didn't get much of it in his own lifetime. And I think it is unfortunate that he spent uh, the latter part of his life away from Ireland, and that he wasn't invited back here more often to give keynote speeches and to receive some sort of an honour in, in recognition of his work. That never happened. And I think that was a sad aspect of the whole thing. Anyway, I'm very glad to have made um, acquaintances with several um, uh, of the Stone-like gang, as it were. Uh, uh, not least, of course, Toby. Uh, Toby was the one who informed me of Martin's passing because Toby uh, would be in direct contact with him uh, quite regularly. And, and of course, Jack Roberts. So at various times this is the in the acknowledgements of the stars and the stones and i'm going to read this list of names because these are people uh, who were all uh, very important to uh, the study of these alignments at various times sorry i'm deeply indebted to my colleague jack roberts and to the other members of the field research teams who helped me collect the essential data for this book at various times the groups included uh, uh, mitsutake chimura john curran owen duffy archibald gibson toby hall Hank Harrison, Deirdre Heffernan, Siobhan Heffernan. By the way, Siobhan Heffernan is friends with me on Facebook, and I, uh, I talk to her regularly. Uh, Sheila Lindsay, Cecily McNamara, Paddy McNamee, Dennis McCarthy, Brian Martin, Paula Miller, John Merrin, Al Morrison, Helen O'Cleary, David O'Hare, uh, Joan O'Sullivan, David Patrick, Lynn Patrick, Beth Rigel, Julie Roberts, uh, Pauline Solon, Robert Stoney, great name for a megalithic researcher, Robert Stoney, uh, Gareth Williams and David Walner. Um, and, you know, at times, uh, Toby and, and Jack and, and Martin would have recalled how they, uh, Jack, uh, Martin had an apartment in Upper Fitzwilliam Street in Dublin. And they would leave there early in the morning in two cars to head to La Crew, one to Carnban. Uh, and one to Schliebnikalia to make uh, various observations. Uh, fascinating times back in the day when uh, things were a lot different back then, I can assure you. Maybe someone could put together a scholarship or some sort of memorial in Martin's honour. Yeah, but this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. He has been pretty much excluded. If you read all of the... I wrote about this in my book, Newgrange Monument Immortality. There was a chapter about the rancor. Um, so I kind of, I can see it from both sides, actually, but it's regrettable, the whole thing. What's most regrettable is that you can read an awful lot of work today um, about Irish megalithic monuments and their alignments and, and not see a single mention of Martin Brennan anywhere, which I think is uh, a little bit of a shame, you know. Um, good, he was able to return to Ireland. Yes, the past is the past. Thanks for mentioning stone light, says Michael Trott. Yeah, they were. Uh, I think they were. They were pioneers. They just. They just weren't archaeologists. They weren't academic. They weren't. You know, they weren't coming at it from that point of view, and they were re resisted by the establishment. Brennan spoke to O'Kelly. O'Kelly passed away in nineteen eighty two. O'Kelly, by the way, Michael O'Kelly, the restorer, the excavator of Newgrange. And O'Kelly basically told him, look, I'm not going to comment on any of your theories, but they actually did maintain dialogue, apparently, even though O'Kelly said, I'm not going to get into a discussion. I'm not going to uh, either uh, condone, I I'm not going to endorse or criticize your theories. I'm just not going to talk about them. And they maintained it, which itself is a bit weird because you'd imagine that O'Kelly would have been interested in all viewpoints. Um, uh, cursive handwriting. Was he an earlier Graham Hancock? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, Hancock, I think, is a little bit more paranoid about the establishment. But I don't think, I got the impression of Martin, he didn't hold a grudge. He said the war was over. 
in an interview he did for for tv around that time 2009 2010 he said the war was over you know um last part of the reading reminded me of the rundale system of or the rundale yeah, of shared land ownership largely stamped out by landlordism but still documented in ireland in the 1970s in some places yeah interesting stuff yeah um Cy B says groundbreaking what uh brennan did and wrote yeah and as i said it's not perfect work and he had not acknowledged that himself not everything he said or wrote was accurate not everything he said turned out to be true but he made some very important discoveries his work on a curb 52 at now the calendar stone has informed my work i've gone into a much more in-depth study of that which i will publish at some point um, and he's the genius on whose sh sh shoulders I stand in that regard. He was the first one to see that, to go, oh, look at this. They seem to be counting out moons here and maybe correlating the lunar year with the solar year. And that's the Metonic cycle, you know. Irish people are very clever, says Lynn Murphy. Well, I'm definitely not going to dispute that. Most archaeology is stuck in the past, and I don't mean that as a pun. <laughs> yes. Um, sad loss, says Burr. Uh, yes, I have the stones of time, which I found fascinating. Yeah, most people who are even remotely interested in this subject uh, have Brennan's book. Uh, I'm very lucky that I got the first edition hardback recently in recent times. Um, I hadn't had it for a long time. What I am sadly missing, really sadly, now I'm hoping it will turn up. So this is an old copy of the stones of time. As you can see, it's falling to bits. I've used it so much over the years, their pages are hanging out of it. But I bought a new copy of this in 2009 at the event, at the Boyne Valley Revision, and Martin signed it for me. And he signed it to Anthony, to, 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 uh, to Anthony from your friend Martin Brennan, and the date and the whole lot, and his lovely, and there was a spiral at the end of his name, which was lovely. And I can't find it. I haven't been able to find it for a long time. I'm hoping that it wasn't taken. Uh, there wouldn't be many people who would be trawling through my library. Just put it that way. There wouldn't be many people in and out here. I incline to think that it's 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 in a box somewhere. It's in it's in the attic somewhere, or just got misplaced or fell down behind a pile of books somewhere, and that I that I will find it. But. At this moment of time, it's the whereabouts is not known to me. And as I say, that's annoying because I wrote a letter to Martin um, probably around 2008, um, around that time, in which I I believe I might have sent a copy of Island of the Setting Sun to him, in which I said, look, basically, I want you to know that uh, you inspired me in a huge way and that I'm very, I just was expressing my gratitude to him for helping me with my work that I had been inspired by him. Now, he never replied to me, but I know that he got the letter because he spoke about it to others and he was able to tell others about me before I then got in contact uh, to bring him to uh, to Ireland. But anyway, uh, just for the sake of a little bit of nostalgia and history, this was uh, something I shared with patrons the other day and I'll just read a little bit of it. This is my first email. Uh, in 2009, I found... I'd heard that Martin had moved from Colorado. I think he lived in Boulder for a long time. He had moved from uh, Boulder in Colorado uh, to Mexico, and uh, he had basically fallen off the radar to a large extent. Uh, and uh, so my task was to uh, to try and track him down. And of course, as I said, he never owned a cell phone. He never had a computer. He never had an email address. Um, all the correspondence in the 80s that was addressed to him, a lot of it ended up going to Thames and Hudson, and they had to redistribute it to him. Um, Johnny Wilson is in Dallas. Good afternoon to you, Johnny. Um, you will find it. He probably has a message for you when you find it. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that happens. Absolutely, Martina, yeah. Um, I wouldn't put him in... Sorry, uh, uh, I don't know who that is. Uh, Fyundan. Uh, Michael Sarion, I, I I I don't have the same regard for. Uh, unfortunately, I think he's he's much more theory the, theoretical and uh, yeah, I don't know, but I'm not familiar enough with his work, I suppose. So this was the beginning of the email that I sent to a gentleman called Chris Bruno. Chris was uh, who at the time I sent this email, I understood that Chris Bruno was Martin's literary agent, but that wasn't actually the case. 
he what Chris Bruno was was a friend of Martin's who had helped him during a very rough time in his life when he was in Colorado, tracked him down as someone who had read his books and become a big fan and thought his work was very important, tracked him down and had supported him and helped him through, as I say, a, a rough period in his, in his life and had uh, stayed friends with Martin. Uh, and so this is how uh, the uh, email b began. Dear Christopher, and of course he was he was Chris, he would never insist on being called uh, uh, Christopher. This was August 2009. I understand from Scott Monaghan. Scott Monaghan had interviewed Martin at the Skull Cave. Is that in Colorado? Um, or is it in New Mexico? It's somewhere in, in, the, yeah, in the middle of the state somewhere. Um, so when I emailed Scott, uh, because Scott had sent me copies of some films he'd done, including the interview with Brennan. So I had Scott's email address. And I said to Scott, look, are you in contact with Martin Brennan? He said, no. But I'll give you the name of the guy who is in touch with them. That's Chris Bruno. So that's how I tracked down Chris. I understand from Scott Monaghan that you might be the literary agent for Martin Brennan. I am seeking to contact Martin on a matter of importance relating to his work on the megalithic art of the ancient Stone Age sites of Ireland. I've communicated with Martin before about two years back by letter. OK, so that was what, 2007, I, I, I sent a letter to Martin. I had just completed my book, Island of the Setting Sun, in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers, written in conjunction with artist Richard Moore. This book owes at least some of its inspiration and its evidence to Brennan's two groundbreaking works, the Boyne Valley Vision and more especially the Stones of Time. Since then, I believe Martin's address has changed. Now I am unsure how to contact him. I'm organising the inaugural Winter Solstice Conference to be held at the Newgrange Lodge in the heart of the Boyne Valley. The event would be held over two days and would consist of talks on the first day and then witnessing the sunrise at Newgrange on the second day, followed by a tour of some of the ancient sites finishing at Douth, where Martin uh, discovered the Winter Solstice alignment back in 1980 uh, with Jack Roberts, I believe, um, and maybe Hank Harrison. I have secured Newgrange Lodge as the venue and am now looking for a keynote speaker. I feel that Martin would have an enormous contribution to make and many, many people in Ireland and beyond would love to hear more about his wonderful research in Ireland. I understand he, I understand he has not returned to Ireland since leaving in the 1980s, but I can assure you he would receive the warmest of welcomes. And thankfully that is exactly what happened in the end. We would be willing to pay his travel costs. He would be given free accommodation at the lodge and would also be paid a fee we could also arrange any travel he might require while in Ireland, e.g. to and from the airport, etc. Very funny story before we finish. Um, on the morning of his arrival into Ireland, so to get into Ireland, a very good friend of his uh, in Mexico was a man called Robert Hancock. And Robert uh, did a lot of the toing and froing between me particularly uh, and the others on this side of the Atlantic, Jack and Toby and Neil Boyle and others. Um, yeah, Robert basically organized everything on Martin's side, got him onto the plane. It was a two a two leg flight, one flight from Mexico to somewhere in the States and the other flight from the States to Dublin. And uh, I arrived at Dublin Airport to bring them up to the Boyne Valley. And an hour had elapsed after their flight had landed and there was no sign of them. And I think it actually went out to two hours and they were the longest two hours of my life because I had been told by Chris Bruno that, look, you know, there's always a possibility that, you know, a, he mightn't travel for various reasons. Um, and so I had sort of that was in the back of my mind. And anyway, about two hours after the plane had landed, there was still no sign of them. Eventually, they emerged and uh, it was it was lovely because Martin was uh, exuberant and in great form, very, um, uh, very heartwarming, heartwarmingly generous, actually, uh, very happy to greet me and to embrace and to give me a big friendly hug. And, you know, he spoke very highly about the work I had done, which was lovely from my point of view, because he was a bit of a hero of mine. Anyway, it turns out that the reason for the delay was they had come from Mexico, where the temperatures were probably in the high 30s Celsius, and they'd come to Ireland and it was a cold winter. It was uh, there was a bit of snow at that time. It was, you know, around zero degrees Celsius or a couple of degrees under. They had basically gone into the gents lavatories to put on long johns and sort of woolly underwear <laughs> to 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 keep them warm while they were here and that's what delayed them um so we came back up the road to 
the Boyne Valley. And as I said, when we got to the New Grange Lodge, there was the uh, the reunion with Jack and Toby. That was just the most wonderful thing uh, to witness. Anyway, so that was my small part in the whole thing was to bring Martin back to Ireland, to give him some semblance of recognition, uh, to to make a fuss about him, to give him some honour uh, for the work that he had done. Very, very glad that I did that now. It was very stressful. I remember the, trying to organise it and try, and the, the fear of him not coming and not showing up was a big thing, especially when you'd sold 100 or 150 tickets to an event and people were going to be there. Uh, and all Martin's friends, of course, some of his friends uh, gave talk. Uh, E.C. Krupp, the uh, a famous astronomer uh, all, was also at the event um and uh um jack T spoke toby spoke and sig longren um who was a uh, uh who is a dowser um uh, also spoke um anyway fascinating uh times interesting and yeah look uh i didn't really play any part in the original uh saga as it were because it was before I mean, when Brennan published um, The Stars and the Stones, I wasn't even 10 years old. But uh, very glad, as I say, to have been inspired by it later. And then to have been so inspired as to bring him back. The only time he was back in Ireland uh, was at my invitation. Now uh, that he has passed on, I am particularly happy I'm particularly glad to have invested the time and the effort in making that happen. Uh, probably would have liked it to be have been even more glitzy and glamorous and, you know, to have been held in a big venue in Dublin and to have gotten more press coverage, but I don't have any regrets, you know. Anyway, um, stay tuned, especially the patrons. Uh, there'll be a lot more about that. As I say, I have a lot of materials. Um so I intend to share some of those with the patrons. If you want to become a patron and get some of the juicy stuff, that's the address there, patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Anyway, thank you for tuning in this evening. Uh, as I say, we're ending on a tribute to the late, great uh, Martin Brennan and, of course, to his Stonelight team. I should mention the late Hank Harrison, who died early last year. Uh, Hank came to Ireland in the year 2000, and uh, myself and Richard Moore met him. Um, and... Uh, he has other claims to fame as well as being in Stonelight. He uh, is the father of Courtney Love and was also at one time the manager of the Grateful Dead. <laughs> it's an extraordinary story. Um, but I'm grateful to Hank for, uh, you know, uh, passing on certain materials. Uh, he he recognised, I think he recognised that uh, I had had a role in uh, uh, Martin's I don't know if you'd call it a rehabilitation. He didn't. He doesn't need it. He didn't need it from me. I can tell you. Um, there's enough. Anybody who's read his work and admires his work. But I mean, with the establishment, you know that there was a bit of peacemaking there, and I'm glad about that. I really am glad about that. I'm glad that that happened now, and I'm glad that it gives me a sense that he went to his, uh, he went to his eternal reward, if you believe in it. Um, you know, with a, a greater sense of peace than he might have done if it hadn't happened anyway i don't want to take too much credit because really uh this is about martin's work and a tribute to him and the brilliance uh, of that work and it was so far ahead of its time that we're still unraveling aspects of it today and that is particularly the stars and the stones published in 1983 folks it's been my pleasure to host you this evening we've passed episode 250 this was 251 please do keep coming back uh, for more and please do pass on a uh, word of the Mythical Ireland uh, 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 social media and YouTube and all of that uh, to your friends and family. Uh, have a great week and don't forget to tune in again next week. We will be back with more. In the meantime, all that remains for me to say to you this evening is Ikawa Kolosov, Slán Gafol, and more importantly than anything else, Togabogay. Take it easy. Good night.